And so it has begun, the 2024 presidential race. I'm Scott Ott with Bill Whittle and Hooray. Stephen Green. And this episode of Right Angles brought to you by the members at BillWhittle.com. Now, technically, the race had already begun because Donald Trump said he was going to run and everybody thinks that Joe Biden is going to run. Uh, but as we record this on Tuesday, the 14th, uh, uh, Nikki Haley, the former governor of South Carolina, former UN ambassador, has released a video and she'll soon give a speech where she announced her candidacy uh, for the presidency, for the Republican nomination for the presidency of the United States. Um, in addition, I read a story today that South Carolina Senator Tim Scott is uh, looks like he may run uh, for the uh, nomination as well. Uh, two South Carolinians there, and uh, the articles pointed out that uh, former President Donald Trump has already secured uh, what do they call those? Endorsements from Senator Lindsey Graham of South Carolina, from the governor of South Carolina, and some other key players in there. But this made me think, uh, this is, I don't want to do a show about what do you think of Nikki Haley or Tim Scott or Donald Trump or anything else. What it made me think of is, how do you conduct a primary campaign and not lose your party? How do you conduct a primary campaign and not destroy the base of people that you're counting on to come out in the general election and vote for your candidate. Um, and so Stephen Green, uh, as you look at what what is the primary responsibility of these candidates and of the party, um, and you see uh, two candidates, frankly, in the early running here, who are probably the least objectionable kinds of people that might rise up to face Donald Trump and the most difficult for for most political candidates outside of Donald Trump would be the, the, the most difficult to challenge uh, because of their status in a couple of ways, you know, one because of her sex, the other because of his, his ethnicity um, and the fact that both of them have been conservative stalwarts and and friends of President Trump. Nikki Haley's book said nothing bad about the President of the United States. She's the, one of the few people who left the administration on good terms. She stood with a spine of steel at the United Nations uh, General Assembly and in the Security Council when few previous ambassadors have. And I just fear that this is going to turn into another one of these uh, Hunger Games type battles <laughs> where everybody comes out muddy and bloody. Steve, what do you think is the proper way for these candidates and this party to handle a, a primary election season? I loathe and I love a bruising, bloody primary fight. Both. Um you got to have a real contest because there's there's it's as close to a dress rehearsal as a presidential race as you're going to get is during the primaries and you know that the other party is going to pull no punches during the uh, during the presidential race unless of course it's a republican like uh, Mitt Romney or John McCain cuz that's the brand uh, that aside um a bruising, bloody primary race is what determines the medal of the candidate and who is going to be the strongest, toughest one to run in the presidential election. But the danger, of course, is that it's going to be too difficult to bring the party back together to, to, to forget all of that stuff uh, instantly. I mean, as soon as the nomination is won, you got to put all that behind you. It's like it's like in The Godfather, uh, when they go to the mattresses. That is, it's it's total gang warfare in New York. Uh, the five families are at war. The uh, four of them all up against the Corleones. And when uh, 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 I think it's Clemenza is explaining to uh, young Michael Corleone why this has to happen, he says this has got to happen every five years, ten years. It gets the bad blood out. Because the five families are all on the same side. They're all running the, the, the illegal booze, the prostitution, the gambling. It's, it's, it's what they do. But resentments arise, problems arise, and killing one another every five or ten years gets the bad blood out. And that's, that's what you're supposed to do during a primary. You get the bad blood out, and then boom, once the election starts, you put it all behind you. The problem is sometimes you get uh, candidates that that uh, have a sort of cult of personality, and it makes it very difficult if they're the loser, if they're if they're not the nominee, for folks to to, to come back on board after the primary is over. Um, and 
this 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 could be a thing, and I'm not trying to make any predictions or cast any blame here. I'm just I'm looking at the candidates themselves. If uh, if Trump isn't the nominee, that may be an issue for the Republicans in 2024. I uh, I honestly have no idea, but that's that's the feeling I get. It was uh, you know I got to tell you it was it was not easy for me to set the bad blood aside in uh, in 2016. Um, Colorado doesn't have a real primary. Uh, we have a beauty contest primary vote for for president. Uh, for the presidential nominee, but it's only a beauty contest. The actual nominee is selected by a convention held for a couple of days down in Colorado Springs. And Donald Trump lost that convention, uh, which, by the way, is the most grassroots thing outside of the Iowa caucuses. Uh, it's done precinct by precinct. It's all grassroots. It's, you know, ringing, door not, ringing doorbells and, and handing out pamphlets and all that stuff. And the uh, the convention itself is done by all these grassroots people down in the springs, and it as I said, it's a very democratic process. Uh, Ted Cruz won it in 2016. Whatever you think of Cruz, I don't care. It doesn't matter. But Trump came in and declared that the big wigs had stolen his victory in Colorado. The big wigs, even though this is a grassroots effort from top to bottom, and he lied. He flat out lied about my friends and my neighbors who were involved in this process. I, I was not involved in this process. And that stung. But you know what? He was the nominee. I let the bad blood go, and he had my full support going into November. That's what we have to do. The bad blood is absolute poison. And whoever the nominee is, if you don't want four more years of the two years we already had and the two more years we're going to get, you better get behind the nominee. Bill Whittle, um, the, the famous uh, Ronald Reagan uh, rule of thou shalt not speak ill of a fellow Republican um, the commandment. would yeah. seem to apply uh, timelessly, uh, but <laughs> I, I, my, I suspect that is not the case. And, um, and, and what I see coming, unfortunately, is going to be a lot of decent people uh, being savaged. Um, and it's not just the candidates, because I, I think a lot of times candidates don't realize that when you attack another candidate in a personal way and you stretch the truth or go beyond, uh, you know, some kind of standard of, of civil discourse, you're hurting those supporters. You're yeah. not just hurting the candidate. I, I used to tell my supporters who were going door to door to door when I was running for office, it's like, look, you can make the case and you can tell what you like about the candidate, which is me in this case. Um, but when you go after a, a, a Democrat or some other candidate that these people were supporting, you're not only attacking the person who's standing on the other side of that door, you're attacking their grandma because they're a Democrat because grandma was a Democrat. And yep. so I just, I don't see any shred of that left in our, in our public discourse. And I guess... Um, my question is, should the party leaders play any role in this or can they even, are they completely neutered? And is it possible that a primary like Steve describes will do more harm for the party than good? It just doesn't, it doesn't just test their mettle. It gives the, it, it helps the Democrats to ammo up. Well, first of all, I don't think Republican leaders should have anything to do with it. Uh, to me, an election is essentially a Republican free primary. It's, Really? Yeah. It, no. Yeah. I don't I think they have anything to do with it. The 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 the, the GOP uh, officials. It, look, the, uh, an election is a is a free market competition, right? And when you start getting the referee in there, being on one side or another, you're going to start screwing around with the results. Th this is something that the people need to decide. Now, I, I think you might have. I look at this differently from you. You started the segment by saying that Nikki Haley had just announced her candidacy for the presidency, but I believe that Nikki Haley had just announced her candidacy for the vice presidency. Agreed. Tim That's Scott, too. That's what I too. think she did. And, um, and so we are in a, a really unusual situation here. I might be missing something really obvious, but certainly on the, on the simple side, whenever a president is running for re-election, that party will produce a few candidates, but they will never really. I mean, who challenged Obama? There must have been, I can't name them, but in the 2012 election, for example, when Obama was running for his second term, 
there must have been other people that were in a primary against him, right? And it just was just, just forget it, right? So if, if you've got a sitting president who's the head of your party running for re-election, then it doesn't really matter how many other candidates are in there because we all know who the nominee is going to be. Now, we're in a, we're in a different situation with Donald Trump because he is not a sitting president, but at the same time, he's not a failed candidate for presidency either, yeah. right? He has been president of the United States. He was elected. So I think that, that look, as, as far as the dynamics of this particular season go, it's going to be, if, if Trump stays in the race, and I can't think of any reason why he wouldn't, then he's going to be the nominee because anybody else, it's over, right? It, it, it's, it, it's just that it's just that's that's it. There's so many Republican voters are, 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 are so committed to Donald Trump that if Donald Trump were to lose to Ron DeSantis or something, th- th- then it, I think it's over, right? I mean, he, he, he's got a voting block that is pretty much rock solid that belongs to him. Uh, so, look, I, I don't want to see a rematch of 2020, but if that's what we're served up, then, then I know which side I'm going to take on this. But here's one thing I did notice about this, is we have to look at, again, when you're... I don't think there's been a, a rematch... And I'm, I understand there's a difference because Trump was out. But first of all, Scott, there's only been one other occasion in history. Was it Grover Cleveland, who was president, then not president, then president again? Yeah, Theodore Roosevelt. No, was it Grover yeah, Cleveland? Cleveland? Roosevelt ran, sure. Roosevelt ran no, no, but, for but, the Bull Moose Party the second time, I yeah, guess. Yeah, no, I'm yeah, sorry, but, I'm not talking about that. There, there was one yeah. person who was like the 31st and 33rd president, yeah. right? They were, they, they were elected, then not elected. So that's 100 years plus ago. And the last time that there's been a rematch that I can think of would probably be Adlai Stevenson versus Eisenhower yeah. uh, in um, in fifty six and fifty two, right? So, so Trump is coming in as an as an incumbent. He's coming in oh. as an incumbent who's had four years off, uh, and, what- and that. Go ahead. Let me throw in something real quick. Somebody pointed out that if Joe Biden wins re-election. In 2024, he will have been cl- born closer to Abraham Lincoln's second inauguration than to his own. <laughs> the country's in the very best of hands, um, but but look, that's 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 the reality of this, right? This this is if when Trump announces that he's in the in the race, then it's then it's Trump's the nominee. And and I think that guys like DeSantis are smart enough to know that that's the case. If DeSantis were to run against Trump, whoever wins that battle is going to lose a significant amount of support that they need to win in, in November. Now, with all that said, right, one thing I have noticed about the people that have run against Trump, the people who ran against him in 2016, and who was, there must have been a few Republicans in 2020, right? I mean, it was just pretty much, this is what I'm saying, he's an incumbent, but one thing I have noticed is is that all of the people that I saw, Republicans that I saw run against him in 2016, virtually all of them were smart enough to not make it personal in terms of like the name calling, right? So Trump could could talk about, you know, little Marco or he could talk about, what did he call Ted? Uh, he, had, he had a term for Ted, boring oh, Ted or whatever. Um, yeah, I can't remember now. Whatever it is, right? They did not respond in kind that way. And so I think the entire Republican nomination process for 2024 is about the vice president of candidate, and that's all, period. I don't see – I'm not saying I don't see anybody who can beat him, although I don't. I'm saying that in order to have a chance to win this thing in November, this, we are essentially looking at the 2024 Republican – primaries and convention as who's going to be the vice president that's what i believe when i look at uh, nikki haley or tim scott or ron DeSantis, um they're when they run for for the presidency if they lose to donald trump for the nomination um, their supporters and they will vote for donald trump in the general election I think Bill suggested, and I would agree, that I don't think it happens the other way. I think that there is a party 
of Republicans and there is a party of Trump supporters. And there's some crossover there. And there are many Republicans who voted for Donald Trump, but there are a lot of Trump supporters who are not there for the Republican party. That's right. not why they got on board. I'm not saying that's a bad thing or a wrong thing or anything else. It's just there. Just you want to bring new people in. That's the way it is. Well, yes and no, Steve. They brought new people, but they didn't bring them in. So the new people, mm. <laughs> they, Fair they didn't distinction. come in. They, yes. In the, the uh, metaphorical tent, it, they're still standing outside the tent cheering for Donald Trump, um, but they have no love for the Republican Party, nor any sense of obligation to the Republican Party. And so um, it, the, the cleanest way things could happen is the way that that Bill has suggested here is that somehow this is, you know, all these people have decided to put their lives on hold for the next two years and do nothing but try to seek the vice presidency, oh. that warm bucket of spit that we all aspire to. You clean that um, up. But I don't really think any of those three people are made that way. I don't see Ron DeSantis bucking for the VP slot. I do. I, I've met. But he's not in. I, what's that? No, he's not. Yeah. But I, um, I, I, I don't know. If, I think he's smart enough to not get in. Yeah. No, he may not get in. But but he's not the kind of guy that runs for vice president. Right. I, I yeah. don't think that Nikki Haley is that kind of person either. Uh, Nikki Haley uh, ran a tight ship when she was governor of South Carolina and really in many ways turned the whole business climate of that state around and, and brought in an infusion of enthusiasm and customer service into the halls of government such as they had not seen before. And, uh, you know, just starting from day one where everybody was to answer the phone, it's a great day in South Carolina, how may I help you? Um, there's just that kind of focus, determined determination that she has. She's not running for vice president, in my view, despite the fact I've seen already a bunch of articles and Bill and Steve suggesting that as well. Uh, oh, no, Scott, I didn't. I, 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 well, okay, I don't you think she's running okay. for vice president, no. I don't think Senator Tim Scott is interested in the vice presidency. Um, so anyway, in any case, it doesn't really matter. What I'm mostly concerned about is, is there any way to run a primary election without so soiling yourself as a party that by the time it gets around to the fall, you've alienated a large chunk of your base. Um, I saw a number of years ago in a gubernatorial race where um, the, the chairman of the party in the state kind of indicated that he was picking favorites uh, in the primaries. And that so offended the supporters of the challenger who had a great uh, run for it that they just said, screw it, we're not voting for the nominee. Um, and I, I think if, if Republicans play this right, they can strengthen the party. If they play it like they've done the last couple of cycles, they can destroy the party. And I'm hoping that they strengthen the party, no matter who the nominee is. Um, I, I trust that any of the challengers that we've heard of so far will be on board, no matter who the nominee is. Um, and I hope that a lot of other people will reflect on the consequences of not supporting the eventual nominee and saying, you know what, um, let's just let ha old Uncle Joe have it again. Um, mm -hmm. That could cause not irreparable harm, but serious harm, hard to reverse harm to this republic. For Bill Whittle and Stephen Green, I'm Scott Ott. Thanks to the members at BillWhittle.com for making Right Angle possible.